Next, moving on to history of implant biomaterials. History dates back to even BC, 2500 years old. Recently, for centuries, there have been multiple researchers and multiple ways of trials and errors in which the implant biomaterial has been enhanced. We will see a basic about what are the different forms of implants which has been used throughout in the history till we reach the latest form which we have been using in current scenario. Starting off, you have a data in which it says in 2500 BC, the Egyptians have tried to use gold wires to reposition the extracted teeth in the patient's mouth. It has been like found out from the skulls which was examined in the pyramids. Next, you have ox bones which has been used. Then again in 500 BC, they have tried gold wires to stabilize the periodontally weakened teeth. The first one was extracted teeth being repositioned, whereas here they use gold wires to stabilize your periodontally weakened teeth. Then in Mayan era, sea shells has been converted into teeth shape and that has been used. Then J. Hunter in 1700 AD, they have used teeth transplantation, that means teeth from one patient and that has been transplanted to another human individual. Then we move on to your gold cylinders and gold tubes later on which was placed in the fresh extraction socket to support your restorations. Moving on to your 19th century, starting off with your Greenfield, he placed a gold cylinder as an artificial root. 1930, orthopedic screws which was used in general orthopedicians that has been used as a dental implant here. It is usually made of vitalium, but it had its own effects which will be discussed later on. Then you have your P. E. B. Adams in 1940 who started off with this cylindrical endosseous implant. Endosseous means it is placed within the bone just like how your natural tooth root is. In 1940s, your Formigini and Zipponi started using a post type endosseous implant and Dahl introduced your superiosteal implant. Superiosteal is nothing but it is under the periosteal layer of the bone, it is not inside the bone. As you can see here in the image, this is a metal framework or an superiosteal implant which is below your soft tissue and below your superiosteal layer, but it is not inside the bone. It is placed in close contact on the surface of the bone as you can see here and you will have studs like abutments which will provide necessary support and retention for your oral intraoral process. Next in 1950, this is a very important turnover or a turning point in the implant dentistry as such which introduced P. I. Brennamark who started the concept of or introduced the concept of osseo integration. This included use of prop compatible biomaterials, designs, clinical applications which was introduced by P. I. Per Ingvar Brennamark in Sweden. He is later called as the father of modern implant dentistry. He used unalloyed titanium, a root form endosseous design and a very controlled conditions for surgery, restoration and maintenance, how you are placing an implant surgically, how the implant crown is placed, how long it takes between your implant surgical placement as well as your implant crown placement duration. All that was designed and this enhanced the concept of osseo integration. Only after this, we started using osseo integrated implants which started having a form of connection with the bone and then the field of implantology grew immensely into how it is nowadays. Next, we move on to the basic provisions. According to the American Dental Association, you have the basic provisions for a material to become a dental implant or a biomaterial which is being under research can be considered as dental implant only after it satisfies these five criteria. It should have physical properties with sufficient strength, it should be ease of fabrication, then it should have a proper sterilization potential without degrading the material, then you have the evaluation of biocompatibility including your cytotoxic testing. Since all this implant materials are being placed inside the body even inside the bone, you have to make sure that it is highly biocompatible to prevent or avoid any form of localized allergy, hypersensitivity or even a host rejection reactions. Then this particular implant should not have any form of defects and before starting to use it commercially, it should have 
undergone minimum of two clinical trials with each of a minimum of 50 human subjects conducted and waited for three to five years for acceptance only after an implant fulfills all these forms of criteria it can be started as a commercial product to be used by dentists throughout the world next we move on to the biocompatibility aspects of your implant materials you have three different sections which is your bulk characterization your surface properties as well as your toxicity consideration of which your toxicity consideration is of great importance when biocompatibility as such is considered but even then your bulk properties or bulk characteristics of your implant materials as well as the surface properties also plays a vital role in acceptance of the implant materials by the human body especially when it is placed inside the bone and maxilla and madam. Your bulk characterization, we have to test the material which is being used as an implant for its mechanical properties. It should have an elastic modulus similar to that of the human bone to prevent any form of untoward stresses should not deform plastically too much then its tensile strength should be adequate and it should have proper fatigue strength because the implant is being placed inside the bone and it is left in that place for a lifetime until unless the implant fails initially you have a properly osseointegrated integrated implant that should stay inside the patient's bone for a very very long time so it should have a proper fatigue strength if not if the implant is not failing initially or if the implant does not undergo any form of fracture due to tensile or shear strength, it can become defective over a period of time because of its low fatigue strength. So, that is why we want a material which has a high fatigue resistance. Next, we move on to your physical properties, it should have adequate hardness, adequate thermal properties since it undergoes multiple process, even sterilization under heat, all that should be bearable then it should not undergo excessive wear and tear when you are using it intraorally because of biodegradation as well as your prosthetic work which we will be doing on top of your existing implant surfaces. The density of the material has to be adequate and the chemical stability it should not undergo any form of electrochemical transformation or it should not undergo any dissolution when exposed to your biological fluids example your saliva or your GCF and other forms of enzymes in the patient's mouth. Next, in surface properties, we have to have a material which will have adequate corrosion resistance properties. Since it is there in your saliva which is exposed throughout the course of its usage. So, when an implant is placed in an oral cavity, it is exposed to constant contact with your saliva and other body fluids. So, it should have adequate corrosion resistance. The surface energy, surface tension, chemical composition and stability of the implant to any form of a chemical reaction has to be adequate. Then the morphology and texture of your implant biomaterial or the implant design as such should be designed in such a way that it has to enhance bone formation when osseointegration happens. Then thickness of the surface coating or an oxide layer. So, we will talk about what is a surface coating on top of an implant in that we will discuss about this and your surface electrical properties again should be favorable for that implant to be retained in the patient's mouth.